Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar on store positioning, one of the key capabilities when it comes to making stores future-proof. Maybe a few words about us first. So Planet Retail RNG is a retail analytics company focusing on the digitalization of retail. So this is not limited to following the growth of e-commerce, but really comprises the entire digital transformation of the sector, its players and consumers, of course. We hereby differentiate between online pure play and omnichannel operations. As you can see on the map, we have offices across the US, the UK, Germany, very lately also Spain and India. My name is Franziska Schmidt. I'm a retail analyst at Planet Retail RNG in Germany, where we're based in Frankfurt. I am part of the go-to-market intelligence team, where we look at the development of retail markets across the world, so be it national or specific city markets even. We identify key growth hotspots in the world and at these spots, what are the channels to play in? So where to play, how to win, these are the key questions we work on. So this is our agenda for today. So first research fundamentals and state of play. Then of course, what actually is store positioning? Then uh, store positioning is dynamic. So here I'll provide you a few case studies. And last but not least, uh, some case studies about winning store positioning cases. Um, I'll take questions at the end of the presentation, so feel free to send them in via the chat function you see on the right-hand side of your screen. If I don't get to reply to all of your questions today, feel free to send them to us directly via mail so we can still provide you with an answer. So let's start with a few research fundamentals so you better understand how we arrive at the concept of store positioning and how it is embedded in our analysis. The underlying approach for all analysis we do is called STEEP, and it helps us get an idea of how retail will look like going forward. STEEP means that we look at key drivers of change across society, technology, economy, industry, and policy, and assess their impact on the future retail landscape. So this is where we combine our propriety global data, industry knowledge, and analyst insight. From our visions of this future retail landscape, we eventually derive winning strategies to prepare for future scenarios. And in total, there are four winning strategies. So e-commerce and digital ecosystem management means e-commerce will become bigger and businesses aim to develop digital ecosystems to drive sales. And this requires huge strategic and operational adjustments. Store of the future, stores move from being purely transactional to social and experiential hubs with implications on assortment, services that are required, and digital features, of course. Supply chain and fulfillment, fulfillment needs to become faster and is geographically more flexible. So supply chains need to enable that and not be a burden. Last but not least, engagement and retention, communication with shoppers has been transforming and become more digital. And offering loyalty point collection is not sufficient anymore. So the question for the most effective engagement method arises. And what we focus on today, obviously, is the store of the future. This slide gives some evidence as to why physical stores need to develop and evolve to remain relevant. On the upper chart, we see how the store opening rate is in constant decline since 2014. So not only in developed markets like the US, for example, what you see here, but really globally. So retailers open fewer and fewer stores. Those stores that are in operation become increasingly smaller, as you can see in the lower chart. While the average sales area of a food retail store was at about 1,000 square meters in 2010, this will be down to not even 900 in 2022. So what we see in this chart is a 13% decline in store size in just 12 years. And shelf space declines even more as aisles become wider, shelves become shorter, plus there's more room dedicated to experience, as we shall see. There are numerous reasons for the challenges physical stores face, and I'll just highlight a few major drivers of change now. So this is actually a very brief version of a steep analysis. One key societal disruptor is aging, and as a result of aging, declining household sizes and rising urbanization. The extent to which these processes progress is different across market development stages, but there are clearly similar global patterns. So shrinking and increasingly urban households will drive the shift away from shipping, shopping at large stores, so usually far away from homes, towards proximity and convenience formats, and online grocery, of course. Another effect of aging is eroding middle classes, as related income redistribution measures will eat into that shopper segment's wallets in particular. 
So the split of the society will somehow be mirrored by food retail at some point. And this suggests a continued expansion of the discount channel and also further growth of digitalized higher end full range grocers that cater to more affluent consumers or less well off ones that want to indulge in something nice at least once in a while. Independent of that, what we also see is that consumers are shifting their spending towards experiences such as entertainment and dining out. Between 1997 and 2022, the retail share of consumer spending is expected to drop by around 12 percentage points, not just in markets like Germany and the UK, which are rather saturated, but really China and even Brazil. As a result, grocery operators are rebalancing their store estates towards smaller urban formats that offer experiential and value-adding services and cater to consumers' demands for convenience. Technology is, of course, having a particularly large impact on retail and increasingly on food retail. With fast rising internet access, speed and smartphone ownership, shoppers increasingly turn into on-demand consumers. Be it goods or information, consumers increasingly ask for instant gratification and food retailers and suppliers have started investing a lot to turn into on-demand enterprises in return to meet all of these new expectations. So the digitalization of retail, which clearly includes e-commerce, is a consequence of all these developments. So currently, as you can see on the chart, around 8% of total retail sales globally are generated online, and we expect this to rise to 11% in 2022. It doesn't sound like a lot, but given all these emerging and developing markets with their really traditional uh, food retail structures in place, this is quite a lot, and it's a fast shift. And much of this shift is either directly or indirectly in the hands of Alibaba and Amazon. And while grocery so far has rather been a little isolated from the online shift, this shift has now clearly picked up speed in that segment. But what do stores now need to do to maintain traffic and sales and how does store positioning actually help? We have identified six key capabilities that are essential to building a store of the future concept. So what you can see here is experiential retail. In what ways will retailers add experiences to stores? And what impact will those have? Merchandise fundamentals. How can a store of the future use merchandise to differentiate and drive traffic? Rethinking the front of store. So how can the front of store evolve to face market challenges and consumer needs? Digital integration. How can retailers provide a truly seamless customer experience between store and online? New measures of success. How can retailers instill a new set of KPIs to reflect the changing role of the store of the future? And last but not least, store positioning. How can retailers assess what store of the future vision is right for them? And are they comfortable driving out costs from the model or adding costs to differentiate? Each of these are analyzed in our store of the future winning strategy report. But today we will focus exclusively on store positioning because we think it's essential for retailers to start by establishing their unique store positioning, which will then guide investment in some of all the other capabilities. Basically, all retailers operate through managing their cost base while offering differentiation. So these are really the two key positioning metrics, as you can see on the right hand side. The combination of both determines a retailer's place in one of eight store positionings, as you can see in the chart. So low cost often means retailers cutting costs by minimizing labor and customer service and offering high number of private labels. Differentiation in turn often means retailer investment to be ultra premium, service focused, highly experiential, or health and wellness targeted. Retailers in a position six, seven, and eight, so in the pink bright, uh, bright pink area, are most at risk to fail as they tend to operate on a relatively high cost base, but offer only limited differentiation. So there's actually hardly a reason to go there, so to speak. And as I said, consumers and their demands change. And those retailers in the pink area risk to lose shoppers to retailers who offer low price and high value, so position one and two, or those who offer high value through differentiation, so position three to five. And on the right hand side, we, few, we see a few examples for each positioning. So we see Dollar General for no frills, Lidl and Aldi, not no frills anymore, but rather low price, a Walmart with its recent activities rather as a hybrid, and Toys R Us an example for position eight. So they've just missed out on the online trend and haven't joined that strongly enough at the beginning and haven't really adapted their store sufficiently to meet these new expectations. 
So we will now take a closer look at the two positioning metrics, differentiation and low cost, and we'll start with differentiation. So differentiation includes experiential retail, merchandise fundamentals, rethinking the front of store and digital integration. And in the boxes, you see a few examples for each pillar. So retail stores will increasingly become a physical portal for brands and product experiences and become places where consumers can actually be inspired, learn, co-work, socialize, and experiment with new products. And workshops, events, and services play a crucial role here. Merchandise fundamentals includes banner diversification to cater to newly emerging or also local needs, for example, convenience stores at traffic hubs, and offering an assortment that really stands out and is a USP of a store, which can include in-house produced products, for example. Rethinking the front of store means enabling fast checkout and fulfillment, so taking out friction of the shopping process. Scan and go and automated pickup stations would be examples here. Digital integration should support experiences or fast shopping processes. So robotics, AR, VR, and gamification would all be valid means for that. Um, of course, retail should invest in initiatives that complement or build on already existing strengths. So, uh, for example, it might be rather weird for an organic slowdown lifestyle retailer to all of a sudden start selling robots through its stores. So this might not really resonate well with its core customer base. So it would be differentiation, but maybe in the wrong store at the wrong time. <laughs> so coming to lowering costs. A number of steep drivers such as internet penetration, pressure on the middle class, and the rapid growth of discounters are forcing retailers to consider cost-cutting initiatives to remain competitive. And this can be done in a number of ways in the fields of front-end, back-end, and assortment. For lowering costs at the front-end, labor automation, digital shelf tags, and ordering screens and self-service are viable means. And assortment-wise, shelf space leasing to brands, especially as discounters now list more brands to raise their appeal to shoppers, range rationalization, and economy private labels will help. At the back end, means to lower costs long term can be using robotics, shelf ready packaging, supply chain optimization, and joining buying groups, for example. So, lowering costs can result in a competitive advantage, but it doesn't necessarily mean lower prices for consumers, as retailers may choose to use their scale or achieve higher margins for other initiatives, for example, in the area of differentiation. Store positioning today requires dynamic adjustment and is a recurring process. And I'll now show you a few evolution cases. So as the slide says, standing still is not an option. Retailers need to continuously invest to maintain their place or they risk falling into a non-sustainable positioning. So that were the position six to eight. So constantly evolving consumer expectations, technology, and investment by other retailers are always redefining leadership in differentiation and low cost. And initiatives that would have led differentiation maybe five years ago, like free Wi-Fi and store, are now just must haves across many positions. So it doesn't differentiate you anymore. And some retailers have managed to shift between positionings. So discounters such as Aldi are adding differentiation to shift from a position of no frills to low price. The body shop was once able to differentiate through its ethical stance, so had a focused differentiation positioning, but this point of difference has rather been eroded as these values have really become a standard across the industry. So the body shop is now just in the high price area. So just two case studies for dynamic positioning in a bit more detail. And as you can see, I have added the store positioning diagram on the upper right hand side, so you can always see where we are at the moment. So this is Lidl. So formerly hard discounter Lidl has shifted from being in a no frills position to low price. And this is the result of an investment program boosting its differentiation and quality proposition that began in the 2000s, really to widen its appeal to a growing middle class of shoppers that need quality products at a low price. And you remember we talked about that in our tiny steep analysis. So this has required changes to its merchandise, stores, and marketing. The shopping experience was enhanced by refurbished and larger stores and the introduction of credit and debit cards. The fresh produce area was enlarged and bakeries were rolled out. And also the introduction of its premium private label deluxe and stronger environmental and sustainability credentials across the assortment have really helped Lidl raise its profile among shoppers and really made it more acceptable for also middle-class shoppers to go there. 
The change to a low price has eventually enabled Lidl to gain share from mainstream supermarket rivals through basically adopting many of the services and features that differentiated them from discounters back in the 90s and early 2000s. Walmart is currently investing heavily in expanding its digital capabilities and reach as it aims to look more like an e-commerce company. So this is quite an openly stated goal of Walmart, as you all know, probably. Um, a series of digital acquisitions and in-house initiatives are positioning Walmart as a physical and digital portal today and have helped it move from low price to hybrid. So examples are the acquisition of Jet.com in 2016 or of the clothing online shops Smart Cloth and Bonobos more recently. Existing stores are refurbished and also here we see a stronger emphasis on fresh and organic. Walmart also tries hard to speed up the payment and fulfillment process. So click and collect has been introduced large scale in various forms and Walmart is also not afraid to risk partial failures on the way to more shopper convenience. Scan and Go, for example, was introduced twice to see if it resonates with shoppers. Eventually, take up remained rather low and Scan and Go was abandoned, but it shows a certain startup mentality at Walmart in the sense of trial and error and really a strong focus on customer friendliness. In all of these initiatives will allow Walmart to differentiate more and appear to a younger, more urban and more affluent shopper base. Um, last but not least, I'll show you three case studies for winning store positionings. So position one, no frills. Uh, so this positioning is not obsolete, although some retailers have worked hard to really move up to low price as we've seen, so Aldi and Lidl. So examples for this no frills positioning would be Dollar General and Poundland today. And the biggest challenge for discounters is to manage the growing need to differentiate with their tight focus on cost at the same time. And merchandise fundamental initiatives should be a priority here to differentiate, but evolving expectations will eventually require investment in digital integration and also rethinking the front of the store as well. So payment and fulfillment optimization, basically. And no frills retailers will particularly benefit by automation, uh, by automating key store functions to lower costs. In this example here, Dollar General has worked on banner diversification and the, the discounter has launched a smaller urban convenience store concept in 2017, which includes a beverage bar, coffee station and grab and go items. So it's really picking up on new customer demands, as we've talked about in our steep analysis. And in May last year, the retailer also partnered with Coca-Cola to launch an exclusive patriotic can series that's, that honors service members, veterans and their families. So position four, differentiation. Um, yeah, left out position three, for example, which would be Walmart and also position two, Aldi and Lidl, because we've talked about it quite a lot. So moving to position four now. Um, this differentiation positioning is difficult to maintain because it requires constant re-evaluation of the latest trends and consumer needs. And examples for this positioning would be Sephora, for example, or Marks and Spencer. And retailers in this positioning are typically leaders in the industry and shoppers look to them for the most innovative and popular products and services. Latest technologies and experiences to sustain shopper excitement and engagement are key. Sephora's new stores focus on value adding services such as free consultations and beauty classes, as well as the use of digital screens to help shoppers find customer products for their individual needs. So in the picture, in the middle, you can see a digital tool where shoppers can indicate what kind of scent they generally like. So it could be honey, for example, or sunflowers for uh, whatever. <laughs> and the screen will then show which of the scents on the right hand side best matches these preferences. So I think many digital features in stores tend to be gimmicky sometimes, but this really helps customers better find products that really match their preferences. So this is really helpful. From a manufacturer side, an example would be Belgian chocolate manufacturer Godiva. And Godiva has created distinct display fixtures inside Sainsbury stores, which include gifting and sharing boxes to really help create a unique brand experience with the confectionery aisle. So position five, focus differentiation. And retailers that belong to the focus differentiation positioning need to justify their even higher price point through superior service or very specialized products that are hard to find in competitor stores. So they must build on a particularly, particular niche space that addresses a very well-targeted consumer segment. 
And these retailers tend to charge a premium in return for their unique placement, coupled with their expertise and benefits. An example would be Whole Foods, which has partnered with Allegro Coffee to offer premium coffee that is roasted in-store to create a unique customer experience. Another example from the manufacturer side, um, Mars has recruited curators to host the Cacao Exchange, an experience taking place in customers' homes that features tastings of a specially created range of chocolates created by chefs. So really giving consumers a particular, a special moment. And uh, this is well in line with the shift to more experiences. So this actually leads me to the Q&A session. Um, I'll give you two recommendations on your way. And of course, if you're interested in more implications and recommendations for retailers and for suppliers, don't hesitate to contact us and be in touch. We're happy to help. So the first one would be, we've talked a lot about digitalization and also rethinking the front of store, which for example means um, introducing self-checkouts. Um, at some point we'll probably also arrive at uh, checkout less stores, but that will take some time until this is large scale. And, and also curbside grocery pickups. So this all requires uh, suppliers to really rethink how they can merchandise particularly in past products. So there's a particular challenge here. Another recommendation would, would be to really uh, cooperate with retailers to find out what are really local needs around stores in precise neighborhoods to really make sure or to really help these retailers stand out and offer consumers something special to really help um, actually survive amateur shift online. So now really opening it up to Q&A. And yeah, as I said, if uh, I don't get to reply to all of your questions today, feel free to send them either to myself directly or to info at planetretail.net and always happy to get back and discuss. Yeah, so first question that came in. Um, as more bricks and mortar stores continue to close, what are immediate steps retailers can take to combat this trend? So, yeah, good one. <laughs> Products are now available very conveniently online and delivery times become shorter and shorter as these have emerged as the real new battlefields in retail, actually. So online is something you increasingly just have to offer, but the question around speed is often decisive. And as a physical retailer, you therefore tend to lose the advantage of fast replenishment or put differently, uh, your online rivals become just better at that and that really fast. And retailers therefore need to position themselves as kind of time-saving problem solvers to consumers, or as I said, as experiential and social hubs. So this, for example, can involve adding services, so health services, like measuring blood pressure, and particularly in the US, many increasingly do so. So this would also consider the trend of aging societies. So people become older and are restricted in their mobility and future pensioners will order many groceries online to not be forced to carry them anymore. But apart from health services that also slowly digitize through telemedicine, for example, they still need these human touch points. So launching in-store cafes and cooking classes where people really come together will help keep up relevance and keep people coming, although they don't really need to anymore to fill their fridges. Yeah, and also things like guided store tours to showcase things like in-store production of bread and sausage, for example, can really help raise transparency levels, create trust among shoppers, and so help create some degree of shopper loyalty. So another question we just got, um, which retailers in the big box channel have done the best job so far in reinventing the store? Um, yeah, a good example that comes to my mind is a Carrefour hypermarket, which I've recently seen in Barcelona. And in this store, uh, Carrefour really highlights very well local produce. So particularly ham and cheese, <laughs> unsurprisingly. And yeah, so they really create a connection between the retailer and uh, the precise region it is located in. Um, they even have close cooperations with farmers where they claim that within 24 hours after harvesting, they get the products right from the farmer's fields into their store. So that obviously is a huge and, and compelling point for consumers. Um, yeah, the, the store also offers food service. So what we've just said, uh, invites people to come to, to socialize and to meet, and of course, increased wealth time. And so hopefully basket sizes. <laughs> 
And it also offers click and collect points. So if you don't have so much time, you can still quickly get your stuff and get home. So here we've got everything. So we've got a fast checkout, we've got the opportunity to socialize, and we've got the connection to the region and really have um, sustainability credentials throughout the source. So in terms of merchandise fundamentals. fundamentals. Um, another example I can think of is the Markthalle Krefeld store here in Germany, and it's by Metro's Real Hypermarket Banner. And they also use an in-store coffee roastery, of course, endless aisles. So if you don't find your products on a shelf, you can order it online. And they also have self-checkouts to, to really guarantee for a fast checkout if you don't want to wait in line ages. And uh, yeah, and also a huge food court uh, in, in a food service area with a uh, freshly baked pizza and that kind of stuff and also in-store production of bread so when you enter the store the fresh smell of bread increasingly or instantly comes to your nose so these are all quite inviting um, features of the store and uh, research has shown that it attracts a lot more people from from the entire area where the store is located and people who thought okay that store is really nice now but probably it's more expensive to to afford all this they have indeed switched to another, luckily, real store nearby. But yeah, it shows that it did attract a lot more people than before in some. Yeah, another question that we got, um, retailers are still reliant on their physical stores for the majority of their revenues and profits. What are the profitability measures and um, pressures these retailers face? Yeah, I think, um, the problem is to make stores attractive and invest in e-commerce at the same time. So joining the e-commerce club too late can be a severe mistake, as we've seen in the case of Toys R Us and also many electronic chains. So you have to be brave and start rather sooner than later to remain part of the game. But if you neglect your store base too much, because most of the investment flows into online, that can really break your neck as well and ruin your reputation with consumers, which is hard to revert. And this is why it is so important to have a clear picture of who you want to be and who you want to target as a retailer. So really finding your store positioning. And I think the need to invest in online end stores would challenge full range retailers' ability to invest in low prices, yeah, which then opens up the space for discount. So one of the strongest growing food retail channels actually in the world, besides convenience, obviously. <laughs> yeah, time for one last question. Uh, for one last question, sorry. <laughs> Um, as the retail market continues to evolve and e-commerce share continues to grow, how has this impacted the discount channel and what opportunities are available to suppliers in the discount channel? So discount has a good outlook with the pressure on middle classes in mind, as we've just discussed, but um, they also need to adapt to new developments and new consumer demands. They have to do e-commerce somehow in the future and I guess click and collect will be the way forward then because it takes out the very high delivery costs low cost is what it's all about in this business model. And current attempts in e-commerce often focus rather on non-food because that takes out complexity as regards cooling chains, etc. And we also see many retreats. So Kaufland and Lidl, for example, have scaled down their attempts. But what we see at the very same time is that they do adapt to certain market demands. So the US market, for example, is a lot more online driven than the German uh, food retail market, for example. So Lidl has learned it needs to offer food delivery somehow. So it has teamed up with Shipped, as you probably all are well aware. So they, they do move if they need to. <laughs> and yeah, opportunities for suppliers are the increased brand listing of discounters, of course. So um, and as they are under immense cost pressure and rising investment requirements, things like leasing space in store might be an option, for example. So yeah, conscious of time, uh, we don't have any anymore, I'm sorry. So uh, yeah, if I couldn't answer your question, feel free to send it via email, as I said. Um, of course, the store positioning report is available at the website. So free for that, not, not free obviously, but if you have a subscription, you can download it. And yeah, I hope this webinar was of interest to you and that you could take some learnings from it and looking forward to your feedback and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. <laughs>